And welcome, everybody. Uh, Nick Lund from Maine Audubon here. Welcome to the fifth in our new Climate Spotlight series, where we're featuring some of Maine's most innovative thinkers, businesses, and conservationists with an aim to help Maine people understand how climate change impacts Maine. Today, our presentation is called Transportation, Maine's big, cl Biggest Climate Hurdle. Uh, transportation and heating remain the biggest contributors to Maine's overall carbon dioxide emissions. And it's clear that if Maine is to meet our ambitious climate reduction goals, we'll need to make major strides in reducing the amount of emissions from the transportation sector. To help us understand how those reductions might happen, we are honored to be joined by two people on the leading edge of transportation policy and technology. Emily Green from the Conservation Law Foundation and Barry Woods from Revision Energy. Um, I'll do some more introductions in a moment, but I have a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first, part of the reason that we are hosting these presentations is to raise awareness of the work of the Maine Climate Council, which is deliberating now on a climate action plan set for release in December, which will guide Maine to our climate reduction goals. Uh, the Climate Council is hosting a pair of public meetings this month to share what they've, what they've learned so far in terms of public comments, uh, cost benefit analysis, and other important updates. The first meeting is tomorrow, September 9th from nine to 12. And I am putting the registration link in the chat for that. Um, the second meeting is, which they're talking about different things, they're not um, covering the same ground, is sep September 16th, also from nine to 12. And I'm putting that registration link in the chat. Uh, we strongly encourage you to register and join those public meetings uh, from the Climate Council if you can. Um, finally, for people who want some more insight and analysis on these September public meetings from the Maine Climate Council, or if for whatever reason you're unable to join the public meetings, um, conservation groups in Maine are excited to announce what we're calling our halftime show on September 17th. Um, this is going to be a one hour recap of the two Climate Council September meetings with insight and analysis from some of the best policy minds in the conservation community. Uh, it's free to register. It's again September 17th, the day after the second Climate Council meeting uh, from noon to one. We would love to have you join. And again, I'm putting that registration link in the chat down below. Okay. Emily Green is senior attorney for CLF Maine where she focuses on issues including climate change, clean energy, and ocean conservation. Uh, previously, she was an assistant attorney general providing comprehensive legal services to Maine's Department of Environmental Protection. And most relevant among her accomplishments today is Emily was a member of the Transportation Working Group for the Maine Climate Council. Uh, welcome, Emily. Oops, and I, I'm hearing that I may, oh, apparently I wasn't sending those links to everybody, so hold on. I was sending them to the panelists and not the attendees. Apologies. So here we go. Let's try that again. Should be three links there on top of each other. The, uh, the, first, the, the first two are the Climate Council meetings, and the second is um, the uh, Climate Halftime Show. So welcome, Emily. Um, Barry Woods is the Director of Electric Vehicle Innovation at the main base renewable energy company, Revision Energy. In his role, he deals with everything from residential electric vehicle chargers to relationships with electric vehicle charging vendors to helping, working, to helping workplaces develop electric vehicle charging resources for their employees. We are pleased to have Revision back presenting with us after having Phil Coop speak a few weeks back on our rooftop solar presentation. Please welcome Barry Woods. Thank you. So just before we get started, finally, um, we're gonna, we have an hour today, just under an hour now. Um, Emily will speak first, followed by Barry, and we hopefully will wrap up around 11.45 or so for questions. If you have questions out there, and I hope that you do, please type them um, not into the chat box here, but into the Q&A box. If you look along the panel on the lower side there, you see two speech balloons with a Q&A. Um, that allows us to uh, collect all the questions and we will answer them at the end of the program. Um, we are filming today. Um, we're, this is a Zoom webinar, which means that all your, uh, the attendees video and, and audio is off. So uh, questions and comments, please put in the Q&A or in the chat. And that is all. Um, thank you to our panelists. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Green to get started. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Nick. And good morning, everybody. I am very pleased to be here, and it's great to see so many people tuning in. Nick, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing my screen? Excellent. 
All right, so um, I'm going to talk about what it means that transportation is Maine's biggest emissions challenge and why that is the case. And then I'm gonna give an overview of some solutions, including some of those that the Maine Climate Council Transportation Working Group has recommended to achieve the state's mandatory decarbonization targets of 80% by 2050 and 45% by 2030. Now, Nick mentioned the Maine Climate Council and I just wanted to let you know real quick what the Transportation Working Group is since I'll be referencing them a handful of times. Basically, there were six working groups formed of different sorts of experts to work during the six first months of 2020 to develop recommendations that are now under consideration by the Maine Climate Council, which will ultimately be putting them together into a climate action plan that is due by the end of the year. So uh, just a quick word about Conservation Law Foundation, where I work. For those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we are a region-wide nonprofit focused on protecting New England's environment for the benefit of all people and for future generations. We focus on people, natural resources, healthy and resilient communities, and sustaining a vibrant economy. To address the region's environmental harms, we use the law, science, and markets. And our strategies for bringing about change include creating and enforcing environmental laws to hold polluters and institutions accountable, driving investment in equitable solutions to environmental and climate change harms, and developing innovative and interdisciplinary legal strategies to restore and protect natural resources, create healthy and resilient communities, and stem the tide of climate change. As uh, Nick said, um, I am a senior attorney at CLF. I work out of our Portland, Maine office. We've got offices in five of the six New England states. My primary focus is on energy and climate change, and that mostly means advocacy to advance decarbonizing and moving away from reliance on fossil fuels in our buildings, our vehicles, and our electricity generation. I direct CLF's transportation electrification work. And as Nick mentioned, I served on the Maine Climate Council Transportation Working Group. So my presentation is going to be divided into two halves. First, I'm going to talk about the transportation emissions problems, and then I'm going to give a high level introduction to some of the critical solutions. So let's get started with the problem. So the major problem here, what you're looking at is a pie chart depicting US greenhouse gas emissions in 2018 segregated by sector. And as you can see, transportation contributes more than a quarter of these climate damaging emissions and is the largest share. It's followed closely by electric power generation, which actually was only bumped into second place within the last few years. Now, what this pie chart doesn't show is the trajectory over time. So since 1990, gross U.S. greenhouse gas emissions have increased by about 4%. However, in the same time period, transportation greenhouse gas emissions have increased by more than 20%. So transportation has really been emerging in recent years as a focal point in efforts to decarbonize and address climate change. Before we move on, I just wanted to really quickly define transportation emissions. Primarily what we're talking about when we say that is emissions that come from burning fossil fuels to power our cars, trucks, ships, trains, planes, and other equipment. So what does this pie chart look like in Maine? Well, as you'll see, transportation is an even bigger piece of the pie here. And just for comparison, keep your eye on the dark blue sliver. So here we are at the national level and here we are in Maine. So the major takeaway here is that transportation in Maine and in fact throughout New England is an even greater share of the emissions pie, responsible for more than 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions right here in Maine. And of course, what that means is that if we are to tackle climate change and if we are to achieve the state's mandatory statutory decarbonization levels, we absolutely must address transportation. So why is the transportation sector such a persistent problem? Well, let's take a closer look at, at uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Maine over time. Now, the United States and New England in particular has reduced greenhouse gas emissions from electric power generation over the last 30 years or so. And as you can see here on the slide, you've got transportation in purple up at the top, and then you've got residential, commercial, industrial, and electric 
represented um, in the bottom half of the chart in lines that more or less tend to decline slightly over time. At the same time that we have done a relatively good job of cleaning up emissions from electricity generation, transportation emissions have actually increased. And frankly put, people are driving more and they're driving bigger, dirtier vehicles. So think SUVs, pickup trucks, the sort of big vehicles that have really become the norm, even for folks that maybe don't necessarily need the extra capacity for work or for a large family or what have you. Now, crazily enough, these overall emissions increases in transportation have occurred even while individual new vehicles get cleaner. So what I mean by that is that vehicle emissions in new vehicles become lower each year on a per mile basis, thanks to federal standards that impose minimum miles per gallon and vehicle emission requirements. So consider for instance that the average MPG for new vehicles in 1990 was 28, compared with nearly 40 in 2018, and yet we're still seeing this transportation increase. So in sum, even as vehicles have become more efficient, Americans have been driving more miles and buying more SUVs and pickup trucks, which have lower gas mileage. Freight trucking is also on the rise. So there we go. Um, this next chart really depicts the point. So this is Maine's breakdown of emissions from within the transportation sector. And as you can see, well over three quarters of the pie comes from driving, driving cars, vans, trucks, and nearly 60% comes from the vehicles that you and I drive around, so personal vehicles. Let's take a quick look at this issue at an even more granular level. Here are transportation emissions in Portland, Maine, where I am. And as you can see, the per person transportation emissions have increased more than 20% in the last 30 years. That's the same time period that we've been focusing on in the last few slides. This per person rise is quite high, even in comparison with other metropolitan areas throughout the country. Now, lest you think that climate damaging greenhouse gas emissions are the only vehicle emissions that we're concerned about, let's talk about air pollution. So cars and trucks, their tailpipes are also responsible for spewing air pollution that can be directly tied to detrimental human health. Um, detrimental hu human health impacts, excuse me. And that includes emissions of particulate matter and ground levels ozone, also known as smog. So who suffers the most from this air pollution? Typically the communities that have historically been the most disadvantaged, like communities of color and low income populations. In Maine, air pollution is particularly harmful for our most vulnerable populations, including children, the elderly, and people who already suffer from health issues. Now, in case the human health angle wasn't compelling enough on its own, it is important to recognize that respiratory illnesses and other diseases that are exacerbated by air pollution pose a real and quantifiable problem with significant costs in terms of both productivity and our healthcare system. So just consider for a moment that asthma is responsible for 8,100 emergency room visits and 13 deaths a year. And air pollution attributable to uh, transportation is one of the things that contributes and exacerbates that. So with that rather dismal outlook, let's move on to the second half of the presentation, solutions. So given the scope of the transportation emissions problem and the urgency demanded by climate change, not to mention the state's mandatory decarbonization targets, which require 45% emissions reductions by 2030, no solution at this point is too big or too small. And at the Maine Climate Council Transportation Working Group, this reality was really reflected in the discussions, which covered everything ranging from alternate fuels to sidewalk enhancements to speed limits and tire inflation levels to rethinking how we work, get educated, play outside, get healthcare, frankly, how we live. We need to reform our transportation systems aggressively and with urgency. Now, strategies for doing so can be categorized in two main buckets. 
strategy, strategies that help people drive less and strategies that clean up the vehicles that we're driving. I'm gonna introduce some of the major solutions in each of these categories. It's not gonna be comprehensive or exhaustive in the interest of time. And then Barry's gonna take a deeper dive into one of the major ones, which is electrification. So to begin with, how do we help people drive less? Whoops. Um, basically, we give them attractive alternatives. So major alternatives, if you live in a metropolitan area, include bus, bus systems and commuter rails. The reason why I've emphasized right-sized transit here is to make the point that there is no one-size-fits-all transit solution. Every community is going to have different needs. Buses and trains typically work well in densely populated areas or for connecting people between different densely populated areas. In more rural places like in northern Maine, it often just won't make sense to have a big bus driving around mostly empty all the time. So we want to make sure that when we're talking about transit and when we're talking about helping people drive less, we're also talking about things like shuttles and vans that run on fixed routes, as well as on-call shuttles and vans that respond in places that just don't have the geography or the population to support fixed routes or widespread fixed routes. In some communities, we're even talking about things like shared vehicles. In fact, shared bikes or scooters might even make sense depending on a community's needs. In most places, you'd ideally have a mix of transportation options that work together. Now, in order for transit to work, there are a number of criteria that need to be met. The option needs to be safe. So this has really been borne out by the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, where we've seen both transit ridership drop precipitously due to unsafe conditions or perceived unsafe conditions. And we've also seen that folks without cars often don't have the option to switch and are therefore potentially disproportionately exposed to the virus. So, so again, transit needs to be safe. Transit also needs to be convenient. It shouldn't take somebody all day to get to the grocery store, and if it does, then it's really not a viable transportation option. And furthermore, transit needs to be accessible and affordable. If someone can't get to the route or can't afford the fare, then it's not helping. Now, as you can see here in this chart, national averages do show that public transportation produces significantly lower greenhouse gas em emissions per passenger mile than private vehicles. And that, of course, is because you have a lot of people riding around in one vehicle, uh, excuse me, one large vehicle, as opposed to one vehicle per person. The Maine Climate Council Transportation Working Group highlighted the need for investment in public transit in its recommendation to the Climate Council, noting that the statewide systems need to be improved in terms of capacity, frequency of service, and connectivity, among other things, and noting that current funding at 86 cents per capita is frankly dismal and distressingly low when compared to the national median of $5 per capita. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skim through this next one, although it is another very important approach for helping people drive less. The concept of smart growth is basically trying to address the root of our transportation issues, which is that people live far away from where they work, shop, see a doctor, go to school, recreate, etc. So the idea here is to develop communities that foster and enable healthy habits that are also good for the environment, like the ability to walk or bike or carpool short, short distances, the ability to conveniently get healthy foods or see a doctor. In other words, the ability to live your life and do the things you need and want to do without burning excess fossil fuels in the process. Along these lines, the Maine Climate Council Transportation Working Group recommended a focus on what they called priority areas development through local, regional, and state land use policies to encourage things such as integrating climate goals into municipal and regional planning, expanding bike and pedestrian facilities, and supporting private investment that will both spur jobs and affordable housing in these priority areas. The priority areas development, again, was the name of that recommendation. 
So now switching gears a little bit, let's move on to strategies for cleaning up vehicles. So again, the two major buckets here are helping people drive less and then cleaning up the vehicles that people are driving. So briefly, the clean car standards is kind of the colloquial term to refer to two different sets of federal regulations. EPA's tailpipe emissions rules under the Clean Air Act and the U.S. Department of Transportation's minimum fuel efficiency standards. So these dictate how many miles per gallon cars must get at a minimum, and they also limit how much greenhouse gases can get spewed out the tailpipe. Now, under the Obama administration, the clean car standards were updated through a public participatory process that aggressively ramped up fuel efficiency and reduced emissions year over year. At the time, these standards were known to be one of the country's most important approaches to tackling emissions for forestalling climate change. Last summer, however, after various fits and starts, the Trump administration finalized one aspect of their rollback of these rules. They concluded that the states could no longer deviate from the federal standards to impose more stringent limitations than those of the federal government. That's something that a, a large number of states have been doing, including five of the six New England states, including Maine. Um, and then earlier this year, the federal government finished the rollback by promulgating what's shown here in the bottom circle, the safer, affordable, fuel efficient vehicles rule for model years 2021 to 2026, passenger cars and light trucks, so called because they liked the acronym SAFE. Um, and basically what this rollback does is it promulgated weaker new federal standards, which when compared with the standards that have been on the books are projected to result in increasing nationwide greenhouse gas emissions by 867 million metric tons, increasing fuel consumption by 84 billion gallons, not to mention increasing premature deaths due to the additional air pollution. Now, a large coalition of states have sued the administration over this new rule, as well as a coalition of nonprofit health and environmental organizations from around the country, including Conservation Law Foundation. The litigation is ongoing and will certainly continue until after the November election. So stay tuned for that one. Finally, the last strategy that I wanted to highlight was electrification. So how else do you clean up vehicles? By switching away from gasoline as a fuel at the same time that you're cleaning up the electricity grid. So why are electric vehicles, or as we find, fondly call them, EVs, better for climate change? Because they're more efficient than their traditional gas guzzling counterparts, and therefore they're responsible for fewer greenhouse gas emissions, even when you include the emissions attributable to electricity generation. Now this map shows that how clean the EV is does depend on the fuel mix creating the electricity. In the US today, the average EV produces greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to driving a gasoline vehicle that gets 88 miles per gallon, which is far cleaner than the average new gas powered car, which are currently averaging around 31 miles per gallon. As you can see to the, well, you know where New England is. As you can see in New England, our electricity generation portfolio is quite clean, which means that driving an average EV here is equivalent to driving a gas powered vehicle that gets over 110 miles per gallon. And what's really exciting is that EVs will continue to get cleaner as states continue to implement policies, many of which are already on the books, to increasingly move toward wind and solar and other renewables for electricity generation. So again, the EV that you buy today might get 114 miles per gallon, but in five or 10 years, that number is going to be a lot higher. Uh, and I, and I, what I mean by that is the equivalent of that number of miles per gallon in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. 
What's more, electric vehicles do not have tailpipes, and so they're not responsible for air pollution on our streets or in our cities or in our schoolyards or in other places where tailpipe emissions tend to congregate and really cause problems for um, typically already disadvantaged communities. And there are a couple of other assets about EVs. So because electric vehicles are essentially large electric batteries on wheels, they also present an array of exciting opportunities to improve the efficiencies of our electricity grid, which can lead to an array of benefits, for instance, enabling more renewable power to come online, deferred electric grid maintenance, and even cost savings. So recognizing the importance of electrification, Maine's Climate Council Transportation Working Group recommended that Maine focus on expanding electrification of light duty vehicles to between 50 to 90% of the fleet and heavy duty vehicles to between 55 to 80% of the fleet by 2050. And with that, I will turn it over to Barry for a deep dive into electric vehicles. So thank you very much for your time. Emily, thank you so much for that overview. That was fantastic. Um, and hopefully we'll get Barry's video back up and going. Um, again, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom. We got a couple already um, and we will get them after Barry. So Barry, take it away. Oh, Nick, can you hear me? I can hear you, all set. Can you see everything? Great, okay. Well, thank you so much, Emily, uh, for that presentation and for CLF's good work in this area. And, and Nick, thank you for the invitation to speak with uh, Maine Audubon and, and these folks as part of your climate series. Um, and also just to reiterate a um, number of points that Emily's brought up. I mean, I think the Maine Climate Council's emphasis on transportation represents a really remarkable opportunity for those of us in the state. So I thought I would talk today just generally about electric vehicle technology um, and I think some of the more interesting opportunities that it presents, a little bit about the market and a little bit about uh, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure and as much as it, it's sort of the flip side of the same coin uh, in order to get people to get interested and treat the technology uh, seriously. So um, it's part of a part of the uh, slide deck, there we go. I wanna just give a brief intro to Revision Energy, whom I'm sure many of you know about. Um, so I'm not gonna belabor the point, but we are an energy transition company that looks, at oppor looks for opportunities to help clients uh, transition away from fossil fuel. And uh, we're in Maine, obviously, in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Uh, we're a certified B Corp, uh, which I take to mean that sustainability is baked into our DNA. And we're also 100% employee owned, which I think we're the first solar company in the US to, to achieve that standard. So um, I think uh, we are tied pretty closely to the communities um, in which we work. And we do a lot of commercial and residential projects. Um, we've done some fairly significant EV charging projects um, to date, including in the state of Maine, working with ChargePoint and Efficiency Maine Trust and putting in uh, what will be, I think, the backbone for the uh, DC fast charging network that'll help people transit longer distances within the state. And that's sort of the first investment that's been made in that area. But we've had a lot of experience to date with both residential and commercial applications for some of the lower amperage charging. And one of the reasons that it's really captivating to us and it should be to you is that if you look at this house, which is really a metaphor for any building, this residence, we're starting to see increasing uh, interest on the part of our customer base, not only to be driving electric and putting in charging stations, but to tie it more directly to the household grid. In particular, the, the solar array on the roof that can provide 100% clean energy, electrical energy, um, and also tying it to some type of battery storage, which in Maine, um, you know, is a very common um, additional uh, energy safeguard that homes have, especially in the winter, instead of, instead of having a propane generator, you can essentially create a microgrid now um, with, uh, with uh, battery storage. And this is all part of, I think, a larger movement towards what's being termed beneficial electrification, which is coming up with technologies that essentially replace fossil, fossil fuel energy for day-to-day -day living and day-to-day -day use of appliances. 
And the vehicle is, I think, one of the most profound opportunities that we have uh, in order to help hasten this transition. And that's really because the vehicle represents the most significant load. And I'm going to focus primarily on light duty passenger, although clearly medium sized heavy duty vehicles are, are starting to have much greater opportunities to, to electrify more manufacturers are engaged in that area. But it's been the light duty that I think, you know, I think represents at least for the moment, I think uh, the greatest, the, the greatest, biggest low hanging fruit for us to convert to electricity. And as this graph shows, from an appliance standpoint, it represents the single largest load on the order of six to 10 kilowatts per day, uh, as compared to a lot of these other appliances, which in the case of uh, the household, usually it's the electric dryer that's the, the largest load, uh, which is not a daily occurrence typically, unless you have a busy household. And so the other thing about the vehicle is, not only does it have a large uh, load, but it's also pretty flexible in terms of when you need to charge it. So it has an, we have an opportunity to control um, when we charge that, which is I think very significant in terms of the grid-based interactivity and grid-based benefits. And when I say six to 10 kilowatts per day, that's, that's on average thinking about the average commute use of the vehicle, anywhere from 20 to 40 miles of, of use per day. And the car batteries are getting bigger, meaning that right now I'd say the standard for the all battery electrics is about 60 kilowatt hours, and they're on their way towards 100 kilowatt hours, which Tesla has as some of its battery choices. Um, I think it's going to probably become the, the standard will be 100 kilowatt uh, our batteries. So even on a daily load of six to 10 kilowatt hours, that represents maybe 10% of the overall battery capacity. And so I want you to be thinking about what that might mean for other potential applications, because, you know, part of my talk today is just to kind of begin the process of getting you to think about driving electric, the environmental benefits, and, um, and, and where it might fit into your day-to-day -day use and, and, the, and the implications uh, for all of us um, in terms of of how we look at our cars and look at look at energy. So the car is a pretty interesting opportunity. And I wanna go back for a second to talk, to talk about Emily's slide, and I apologize if this one's a little bit, um, not quite as in clean a detail, but I wanted to just point out that main, you know, certainly transportation, light duty passenger represents a huge emission, source of emissions. Um, and the other side of the pie is primarily built environment, residential, commercial, industrial. So together, you know, comprising about 93% of the emission um, outflow in Maine. And I want us to think about how when transportation transitions, it actually becomes a symbiotic relationship with the, with the built environment because it's not only a question of the batteries being charged by clean energy sources, but because such a low percentage of the batteries are being used for transportation applications on a day-to-day -day basis. I think there's a way for us to creatively structure incentives and other, other means to get consumers to relinquish some of that battery load to go to the, toward the built environment to also help uh, particularly during peak load times, you know, cut down on, on that emission. So it really is a rising tide, you know, lifts all ships. And we need to be thinking about these vehicles um, not only as cleaner energy for transportation, but cleaner sources of energy for many, many other areas that we are um, interacting with daily. In large measure, that's because um, we don't use the cars as much as we think we do. If you look at the bottom uh, line, you know, it's pretty clear that a car is a stationary inanimate object for much of its life uh, uh, expectancy, particularly at home at night and during the day, back when we used to commute uh, to work, if you can remember that far back. Um, there's, there's large periods of time the car is basically a static uh, asset. And what that translates into, as Emily alluded, is the opportunity to charge using different types of renewable energy sources, which might otherwise, because of their intermittency, be lost. But I also want us to think about the fact that the cars, not only the, the stationary periods of time the cars um, during the day um, at rest, also reflects an opportunity for the car to be disgorging energy too. And so it's sort of a bi-directional flow. And we are starting to see companies that are working with manufacturers to harness the battery for these types of applications. So it's this concept of V2G is not really so much of a pie in the sky thought process as it was even five years ago. We are starting to see companies like NLX and Fermata uh, and others partnering with manufacturers to, to get access to batteries for these types of applications. And the other thing I want you to think about is for those of you who aren't familiar with driving EVs, I mean, 
the, the, the reality is most people do charge their vehicles um, at home overnight when the grid is very much underutilized, as well as during the day they can be charged when solar is most active and capture benefits um, you know, directly from, from that uh, clean energy source. So the car is something that is becoming an integral part of the grid future and providing potentially uh, value to the consumer where per perhaps utilities will reimburse consumers for use of a certain percentage of their batteries at particular times of the of the day or of the or of the year based on uh, based on the need uh, not something that you think about right now when you look out at your vehicle probably sitting in the driveway and and uh, and and how it can otherwise be connected it, it can't so that's one of the huge benefits and, and I think in order for this to be successful the transition to Electric, electrification in the transportation space, we have to look at it as being disruptive in the purest form, which means that it can't just be a little bit better than what we're driving, particularly for the average consumer. It has to be dramatically better. And not only do we see the environmental benefits that Emily articulated, but we see better driving experience um, in terms of silence, uh, smoothness, torque, uh, reduced transportation costs in terms of operational costs and maintenance costs. Um, I think I checked yesterday and in Maine you'd save about 50 cents a quote e-gallon even with gas prices hovering in the low two dollar range um, and and so those are I think are pretty critical to why this is a dramatic uh, improvement and the other thing is that we have until the until we have a level playing field until the technology reaches a certain point um, you know a lot of incentives that are available um, both for the cars in the form of uh, state incentives right now with efficiency main trust um, and even charging infrastructure there's a federal tax credit available for residences and commercial and there's now as of last week we had an announcement um, by central main power and efficiency main trust for commercial workplace uh, larger cluster level two charging uh, pilot pilot study that provides some incentives for those types of applications so um, these are all these are all reasons for I think all of us to look seriously at driving electric and to appreciate why it's so much better than using an internal combustion vehicle. Um, and in fact, we do have vehicles now that are able to get 200 plus miles of range routinely. Um, Tesla by far represents the largest share market share, but there's other companies like Kia and Hyundai and Nissan and uh, GM that have products like the Bolt and the Leaf that fall, I think, well within typical consumer price points. Unfortunately, I would have to say right now that probably the majority of the larger range, the longer range vehicles tend to be a little bit more expensive, but you can still get the, the Tesla Model 3 and the Y under 50,000 and qualify for efficiency main trust incentives. And, and I think the good news is that that's going to change. Um, if you look at where the industry analysts are projecting um, costs to go, cost uh, savings to go in the near future. This is a Bloomberg chart. I mean, we're seeing that the, the crossover between uh, combustion and electric could happen as soon as 2002, um, when the battery costs due to scale dr uh, drop down to closer to $100 per kilowatt hour. And that's obviously a pretty dramatic um, point in the, the inflection point in the adoption of, of electric vehicles and very critical. Um, and so we are going to see, I think, the costs of these vehicles continue uh, to go down, much as solar panels have, done, have gone down over the last 15 years. Um, and there are choices now that adopt uh, electricity in platforms that consumers are pushing, like Emily suggested, in terms of SUVs and pickups. Here's just three examples that are on the road and available in Maine and New England that can satisfy many consumers. Some of them are plug-in hybrid electrics. Uh, some of them are all battery electrics like the Hyundai Kona. Um, and I urge you to take a look at those for your next vehicle um, because I think you'll be very surprised, pleasantly surprised, not only at the cost savings, but at the performance. And then I think we're now actually debating what is potentially going to be the best electric pickup to deploy. These are just a couple of examples of the Tesla and the Nikola Badger pickups, but we've got Rivian, we've got Ford um, presenting their F-150 and, and, and a number of pickup platforms, which are really critical to success in the, in the light duty uh, passenger um, market, particularly with fleet adoption. And those are, some of these are due out in the next year. Um, 
I'd have to say it's been a slow year in terms of new vehicles, but I think next year we're gonna see many, many more models starting to deploy, which is really important, um, including models that capture consumers' imaginations like retrofitted um, you know, VW bug, or I'm sorry, bus, um, which uh, you know, provides a glimpse of how the future, you know, what the future is gonna be like um, for, for consumer choices. And then lastly, just to speak briefly, because I think, Again, it's sort of the flip side of the coin. People always want to know about charging because it's very different than a gas station model. Um, and people get concerned about you know, range and wanting to figure out how to charge. And the good news is that it's actually a lot simpler than most people are aware. Um, I've been driving since electric since 2011 and by far the majority of my charging occurs at home during the evening uh, hours, early morning hours. And it can, take an, it can take an hour, it can take eight hours, depending on how much you use. You can charge cars much faster now for highway travel with the, D, the DC fast charging networks that we've talked about. Basically any place that cars are, are parked for long periods of time, I think represent an opportunity for cars to charge like workplaces. And the other thing that I've noticed is that most drivers do think about charging fairly frequently and will take advantage of charging wherever they find it so they keep the battery full. Um, I think the batteries are gonna continue to get larger. I think that the concern um, about range and frequency of charge is gonna diminish. Um, I think 100 kilowatt hours is gonna become the standard which translates into 300 plus miles of range which is really a robust amount of uh, range on a day-to-day -day or even intermittent longer distance traveling, um, you know, uh, behavior. And so um, I urge you to take a car out for a spin and, and try it out. But I also want you to be thinking about the implications of connecting these vehicles to the grid and what that might mean, you know, to you and to your business, uh, your, your, your businesses. Um, and also thinking about um, from a charging standpoint, these new pilots and how you might be able to help find hosts for central main power and efficiency main trust uh, with their new programs because getting more charging out does increase visibility even if people don't use it as much as they think. And I think it's important to, to get to help us transition and meet the very robust um, emission goals that the Maine Climate Council and the state have, have outlined. Um, so with that, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Feel free to to reach out to me directly by email or phone. And uh, thanks again, Nick, for the chance to talk about this today. Thank you, Barry, that was fantastic. And uh, believe it or not, we are right on schedule, uh, which is good because we have uh, quite a few questions down here. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump into the questions. Uh, they're for, uh, for, for each of you or, or from the full presentation. So uh, I'm gonna start with a question from Ernie, um, I think to, to Emily. Uh, Ernie asks, to what extent do emissions from planes, boats, and cars contribute to transportation emission versus semis and other large trucks? Thanks for the question. And I'll just refer back to one of my earlier slides that showed that in Maine, rail, marine, and aviation is responsible for around 14% or so in comparison to about 27% coming from medium and heavy duty vehicles. And those numbers aren't um, so different than they are at the national level. So um, nationwide, you also see more coming from on the road driving than you do from the rail marine, et cetera. Excellent. Um, a couple questions, um, one from, from Gina and one from uh, an anonymous attendee just now about the um, environmental impacts of um, the manufacture of uh, the batteries or electric vehicles and then maybe the post-life um, uh, handling of the waste. Can, can you speak to those um, issues? I could take a quick shot at that. I mean, I, I think that it's something that most manufacturers are very sensitive to. Um, I think, for example, BMW, the i3 that's been out, I mean, they brag about that 90% of it is recyclable and it has some, a, lot, a fair amount of sustainable materials built into it. Um, so I think the industry is aware of this concern. And to reiterate, I think one of Emily's points, it's always better to not drive <laughs> if we can avoid, you know, driving. I think whether it's an electric vehicle or a combustion vehicle, that is certainly a, a, a good solution. But clearly that's not, that's not practical for a lot of people. So I think that the manufacturers are very aware of it. I've seen some studies out that suggest that the manufacturing emission-based burden by five years of operation is basically getting the car to net zero. I think that's probably looking at the, ba the battery 
um, related issues. Um, I think the batteries are currently, you know, recyclable in large part as well. So clearly it's, it's a reasonable question and there's, there's legitimate concerns. It's, a, it's something the industry is definitely working hard to, to be able to provide uh, a sustainable solution to. Great. Um, a question from Daniel I'd like to get to. Um, he says he loved his next car to be an electric vehicle, but he works from home and lives in a multi-unit dwelling. Um, is there any movement around the country to you know, require builders or, or require other uh, you know, folks to install community EV chargers in their dwellings? Yeah, why don't I take a first stab at that one? Um, so yes, absolutely. There are some policies in place, for instance, in building codes, um, or at least being talked about where things like um, chargers and multi-unit dwellings should be considered or should be required. Multi-unit dwellings are also often prioritized in the sort of programs that Barry mentioned earlier with respect to the efficiency main trust um, incentive programs and essential main powers make ready program where they basically offer um, incentives for EV chargers. And again, locations like multi-unit dwellings or public places are often given priority in situations like that. Yeah, I think it's a growing concern. I mean, it's a growing concern. Maine doesn't have as much of a housing uh, inventory in the area of multi-unit dwelling, but you know, we have condos and, and certainly we have, we have a certain percentage of the housing stock that fits that. I think um, we are seeing some interesting solutions in cities like Seattle, which are creating like a DC fast charging uh, cluster in dense neighborhoods. So you can go in and charge for 20 minutes, you know, um, and, and be ready to go, bring it back to your, bring it back to your local parking space. Um, it's an area there's going to be more creativity and I think we will see building codes. Um, you know, the other thing I'd add that's I think interesting in this area is that, you know, we're starting to see in Maine the ability to participate in community solar farms, which from a generation standpoint means that you can live in an apartment and be a member of a solar, you know, project that, that can fuel the vehicle. So that's, you know, that's another interesting uh, element to think about. Great. Uh, and I should say too that Efficiency Maine has a map on their website of charging locations around the state that folks can use. Uh, you'll notice that one of those stations is at our Gilsland Farm headquarters in Falmouth. Um, almost every morning we come in and someone's uh, drinking some coffee and charging their car up. It's pretty cool. Um, question from uh, Eliza from Maine Audubon, my colleague, our uh, advocacy director. Uh, for Barry, could you please provide some more details about the current state um, and federal incentives, oh, state and federal incentives for purchasing EVs. Yeah, for purchasing EVs, uh, I think you know, the state incentive is, a, it's in the form of a point of sale rebate that Efficiency Main Trust administers. It's $2,000 for all battery electrics. I would go on their website to get details because they will list the eligible models. I think they have to get more than 17 or 20 miles of, of electric range to qualify and be below $50,000. So that's one that's a pretty immediate one. This, the feds still have a $7,500 tax credit available uh, for certain manufacturers. Some manufacturers have basically exceeded the cap on that, like Tesla and GM, but uh, you'd have to check with the manufacturers to see you know, if the vehicle you're looking at still qualifies. That's a, a tax incentive, uh, a credit, so it's not necessarily available to everybody, but it it's, can be a significant reduction in the, in the cost of the, of the lease or the, or the uh, purchase. Great, thanks. Um, a couple questions for Emily uh, about the uh, Transportation Working Group's recommendations for the Climate Council. Uh, There's a question from Marna about um, the recommendations regarding EVs versus plug-in hybrids. Uh, and also a question uh, from Karen about TCI. You want to talk about that? Sure. So I'll start with the question regarding the Climate Council's recommendations. And um, I guess I should clarify the recommendations of the Climate Council Working Group, which were premised upon some modeling that was conducted for the group. And the modeling looked at transport, uh, looked at emissions reductions due to electrification. I don't think they looked at hybrids. So I, those high level numbers was primarily focused on pure electrification. However, one of the strategies that the working group recommended in order to bring about those levels 
um, was expansion of the state's existing incentive programs, which is currently available to hybrid vehicles. And uh, the recommendation was for that program um, to be expanded and funded, um, but also to continue to fund hybrid vehicles. So Barry, I'm happy to pause if you want to say anything else about your No, program. I think you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Okay. So, um, on TCI, I think the question was, what are the pros and cons of TCI? And I think it's really important to couch any conversation about TCI first in terms of this important caveat, which is that it doesn't really exist yet. Um, so we don't know exactly what TCI is going to look like. It is still very much in development. Um, so with that, what I would say about it is that TCI, which, uh, sorry, for other folks on the phone, this is the Transportation and Climate Initiative. It is a regional initiative that, as I said, is currently underway and that would essentially cap emissions from the transportation sector by selling allowances, um, which monies would then be allocated amongst the states. Which brings me to one of the major pros of the program. Um, it would generate potentially a lot of revenue for the state that could be used towards all of these other transportation related solutions um, that Barry and I have been talking about and which you may have noticed will cost a lot of money, some of them, in order to implement. So um, that's a major pro is the potential for fund generation in the state. But again, given the caveat that we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, um, I, I think that's really all I could say about it at the time. Great, thank you. Um, Barry, a couple of questions for you on sort of the, the technical pieces of electric vehicle charging. Um, one from Eileen, um, do miles held by batteries diminish with time? Uh, for example, if you don't drive uh, the miles in a certain day, do, do, does, the, does the battery diminish? Um, and also before we get off, uh, when someone is charging out of business, do they pay? How do they pay for the electricity? Yeah. All right. Well, the first one, actually, there's there's greater resiliency to these batteries than I think even the industry anticipated. So I don't see degradation from lack of from just having it sit uh, and not using it as being a huge uh, uh, issue, at least to date. Um, obviously, they degrade over time through usage, but uh, letting it sit has been pretty de minimis. Um, as far as, um, and, and I mean, they do note, we do notice some reduction in the cold for sure, but that's different than I think what the question is getting at in terms of just leaving, leaving the vehicle um, without being used. And I'm sorry, second question was um, relating to workplace charging and how to, I think we see a variety of models on that. I think some employers and even some businesses will let you charge for free. Um, like Maine Audubon, you know, go to Maine Audubon and charge up and, you know, you get to participate, go to the gift shop, get some great <laughs> cards, get your bird seed. You know, the idea is to use it as an attractor. I guess it's kind of like a bird feeder, um, you know, to come in right. and, uh, and uh, you know, use the, use the electricity as a, uh, as a means of, you know, generating business, indirect kind of uh, benefits. So that's one way. We haven't, we haven't really seen the maturity um, of uh, deployment sufficiently to, you know, provide revenue from provide from billing for the electricity. People do it, but it's it really depends on the usage levels. And many most of the northern New England states, the deployment levels have not been very robust. Certainly, COVID has even provided a hit in terms of tourism-based, you know, usage of charging. So it's developing, but I think most of the, a lot of vendors provide it for free. Great. Yeah. And I know, please welcome. Come on to Gilson Farm. Uh, you can wander the grounds as you charge up your car. It's a great place to do it. Um, a couple of questions about sort of tax policy surrounding some of these vehicles. Um, you know, uh, Ernie notes that um, some, some areas might have put, uh, increased a tax on uh, gas powered cars to subsidize charging stations or other things like that. Um, and also sort of the flip side of that is that some states are, you know, sort of putting surcharges on electric vehicles to make up for the loss in gas tax revenue. Um, could you maybe give a quick overview of um, some of those options around the country or, or what other states are thinking about? Emily, you want to take a shot at it or do you want me to? Why don't you go ahead? Um, I think that uh, this has been an area of interest for a lot of states. I think um, the, the use of road tax, for example, for EVs because they don't pay for gas, um, which gas you know, provides fuel tax. 
Um, I haven't seen a lot of use of gas fuel tax for providing electric vehicle infrastructure. So if you know of a state that's doing that, please let me, please let me know. I'd love to see that policy. But I think we are seeing frequently questions about why do EV drivers not have an opportunity to drive, uh, to pay, you know, why do they have an opportunity to drive without paying their fair share? And I think that's definitely something that's on the horizon as the vehicles deploy. Right now, we don't have a, a, a robust enough population of plug-in vehicles to justify the administrative expenses for that type of a, uh, of, a, uh, of a new tax system, whether it's a flat fee or some type of road use. It's coming. I think there's a guilt complex that EV drivers have even now about driving and not contributing to the infrastructure the way they realize that they should. And so I don't think it's going to be a huge political issue. I think the devil will be in the details for that. And I would just add that um, funding, including some of the tax issues that you've raised, were on the table and were sort of passed along as potential recommendations from the Transportation Working Group to the Climate Council. One other um, point I would just make about taxing gas and diesel for your consideration is that um, a tax like that is, is somewhat concerning until and unless you have helps people to do something other than drive their cars. So unless you're ramping up um, you know, your electrification incentives or your transit, then it, it can be problematic to just start tacking on taxes to gas and diesel. Yeah, and EV drivers do pay tax on electricity. It's just not going, it's just not going to support the infrastructure that they're actually using, that's all. Right. Um, so we're, we're running low on time here, but I want to try to squeeze in a few more. Um, Emily, are you aware, um, a question from Carrie here, about um, how much of the emissions increase from transportation is coming from in-state versus out-of-state drivers? Uh, so I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the numbers that I gave were for emissions within the state, so it would have included tourist drivers but I don't know the split off, offhand between tourist drivers and local drivers. Um, but obviously, Maine does have a significant uh, number of people that comes and visits the state every year, and we have to think about their transportation and their transportation choices and options as we think about the state's transportation future. Excellent. Well, I see it is noon on the dot, and so I'm going to stick to our agenda here and, and stop us now. Um, if you have additional questions for our panelists or some of the questions we didn't get to, um, if uh, Emily and Barry, you would be so kind as to put your emails maybe in the chat, um, oh, yeah. folks would be able to, to reach out afterwards. Um, I really want to thank uh, both of you, Emily from CLF and Barry from Revision for coming and joining us today. This was fantastic. Um, this was recorded and we will put it up on our main Audubon website uh, as soon as we can. So if you missed pieces of it or there, you want to revisit, then you can join us there. Um, Emily Barry, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a great week and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank Nick. you. Nice Take care. Nice Take care. You. Okay.